It was definitely cut those off. All right, so chapter eight, dealing with um, cash and internal control. So what does it mean to have internal control? It means that we have certain policies and procedures set up so that we can protect the assets of the company. We can make sure that there's reliable accounting taking place and that we can adhere to whatever company policy is in place and also promote more effective and efficient operations. You guys remember me talking about Sarbanes Oxley from chapter one, where we discussed that that legislation was put in place to protect um, investors. And what are we being protected from? Investors are being protected in terms of earnings. They invest in these companies, they're shareholders in these corporations. So, you know, they look for the corporation to establish and uh, publish accurate financial statements and annual reports. Now, there's a section of SOX, Section 404, that will require the management team um, of a corporation to make sure and attest to all internal control um, being accurate and followed properly um, to maintain the integrity of financial reporting. So here are some principles of internal control. And the reason why we call them principles is because this is what they're governed by. This is what they follow. They establish responsibilities for every person that is um, responsible for um, financial records. So establish responsibility. They maintain adequate records, meaning, you know, free of error. They maintain um, bonds for employees. If you guys have never heard of that. Sometimes when you are trying to um, get a position at a company, they may say, are you bondable? Um, basically, are you insurable? Um, if you should make a mistake that is of huge negligence, um, can we reasonably bond you so that we're not out of money that you've caused us to lose You know, because you made a mistake? Um, so insure assets and bond key employees uh, separate... I'm sorry, separate record keeping from custody of assets, meaning the person that does the records is probably not the person who's responsible for uh, valuation and all of that of assets for the corporation. They have to divide responsibility for related transactions. That means the same person who cuts the check is not the same person who signs the check. So segregation of duties. And then apply technological controls, meaning using technology to uh, render more accurate books and then perform regular and independent reviews, which is the responsibility of management anyway, to review on a periodic uh, basis. So technology and internal control. Technology reduces processing errors. It also um, limits you know, a lot of the paperwork as far as it comes to processing. Uh, more extensive testing of records when you're dealing with technology. You have obviously in, increased e-commerce, especially for those companies that produce product and sell product. And it has to be a crucial uh, separation of duties because, again, the person that writes the checks is not the person that signs them. So what are some limitations of internal control? We got human error. We all make mistakes, right? So if you're doing the books for... A corporation more than likely you might make some small mistakes whether they be um, you know dollar mistakes you might put in the wrong check number or anything so that's just basic negligence um, you might make mistakes because you're fatigued or tired uh, you might have a lapse of judgment or misjudgment it might be some confusion in what you're reading so that's all a part of human error that is totally different from human fraud because human fraud means you intended to um, steal or take from the company so you do things for personal gain so that you can um, you know steal so remember the fraud triangle that we talked about in chapter one and the way it works is the opportunity is presented for somebody to you know commit fraud and then they have pressure because it might be somebody else involved or just the pressures of personal life you know maybe they have bills that are behind or you know, owe somebody money or whatever. So that creates pressure. And then they rationalize it by saying, oh, well, you know, it's just a couple of hundred bucks. This is a million dollar company. They won't miss a couple of hundred bucks. 
even if it is a million dollar, multi-million dollar, billion dollar, it doesn't matter. You still, you still. It's not yours to take, right? So it's all fraud. So another limitation of control, we like to call it the cost benefit uh, constraint in accounting. That just means that cost should not exceed the benefit of it. So if it's not more beneficial for you to start doing accounting a different way and the cost exceed the benefit, then it's not worth you doing it. But that is a limitation. So see if you can figure these out. They're asking out of this list, what is a purpose of internal control, a principle of internal control, or a limitation of internal control? So for instance, for protect assets, which one do you think that is? What is it? You think protect asset is A? What about established responsibilities? Purpose, principle, or limitation? Okay, I heard C. Three, human error. Purpose, principle, or limitation? Limitation. C. Four, maintain adequate records. B. Five, apply technological controls. B. Six, ensure reliable accounting. A. Seven, ensure assets and bond key employees. Five, human fraud. C. Nine, separate uh, record keeping from custody of assets. B. Ten, divide responsibility for related transactions. B. 11, cost benefit principle. C. C. 12, promote efficient operation. C. C. 13, perform regular and independent reviews. B. B. I'm just writing what you say. Urge adherence to company policies. B. B. Let's see how right you were. So to protect assets, ensure reliable accounting, and promote efficient operations, as well as urge adherence to company policies, all of that it are uh, all of those are purposes of internal control. Where is establish responsibilities, maintain adequate records, supply technological controls, ensure assets and bond key employees, separate record keeping from custody of assets, divide responsibility of related transactions, and perform regular and independent reviews. Those are principles. And then, of course, human error, human fraud, and the cost-benefit constraint is all um, limitations. The way that you have to look at it is this. A purpose of internal control just means what? We have internal control in order to do what? That's what the purpose will be. We have internal control to make sure that we protect assets, right? We have internal control to make sure that we ensure reliable accounting. Whereas the principle means those are what we're governed by. So we know a principle is for us to establish responsibilities in um, the corporation and also maintain adequate records, make sure that we utilize technology uh, controls and so forth. Cash, cash equivalents, and liquidity. We all know what cash is. We talk about cash liquidity very briefly in the class so far because we uh, talked about how assets that can be easily converted to cash within 12 months could be considered, you know, short-term cash equivalent. So cash, control of cash is the internal <coughs> control system that is going to protect cash and cash equivalents and have to meet these three um, guidelines. 
First guideline is handling cash is always separated from record keeping for cash. So the person that counts for cash is not the same person that keeps the books for the cash. Cash receipts and prompt are promptly deposited in the bank, meaning that day, not next week, not five weeks from now, not two months from now. Cash disbursements are made by check. No corporation pays any bill by cash. They might purchase some very small things with petty cash, but overall, they pay all bills with a check, right? So cash and cash equivalents. We know cash is currency, coins, the amounts that you po deposit in the bank, checking account, savings account, some savings anyway, um, include things like checks, cashier checks, certified checks, money order is all synonymous with cash. However, a cash equivalent is highly liquid, meaning it's highly convertible to cash very easily and close to the maturity date and it's not sensitive to interest rate change. So a perfect example would be accounts receivable. We know we put accounts um, put customers on account so that they can get the product or get the services and pay later, right? But it's quicker and it's more feasible for you to collect that cash than it is collecting cash on a note that's not to be paid a year from now. Does everybody understand? So what are the goals of management as far as cash management is concerned? To make sure that the cash receipts also meet the payments when they are due and to make sure there is a minimum level of cash that is kept on hand um, necessary to operate. So there's still a business. They have to operate every day. They have to pay their employees. They have to pay their bills. So they can't just use all their cash to pay all their bills immediately. Um, effective cash management involves applying these principles. Encourage collection of receivables. We typically give customers, what, 30 days? Um, but customers sometimes will pay 60 days, 90 days, 120 days. So it's always encouraged if you want to have um, solid cash management to make sure you collect receivables as soon as you can. Delay payment of liabilities. They don't pay all their liabilities right away. Because some liabilities are more long term. Therefore, they can keep some cash on hand for operating purposes. Keep only necessary levels of cash, plan expenditures. Um, invest excess cash, which is typically their retained earnings that they reinvest into something else. Um, plan expenditures. They don't just go out and plan to buy a new piece of equipment without looking at the particulars first. Just because they have the money doesn't mean that they need to go and buy it right away. Control of cash receipts. So this is just a basic illustration showing you how sales happen in the sales department and then it's transferred over to the cashier department who in turn makes sure, make sure that the accounting has an accurate record keeping. So look at this example. It says sometimes errors in making change are discovered from differences between the cash in the cash register and the record of the amount of cash receipts. So this cash register shows $550 as far as the count um, of the record rather of what was actually sold for the day. But then the actual physical count of cash came out to 555. So this is the journal entry we prepare. We debit cash for that 555 that we know we have. And we credit sales for 550 because that's what the system said we made for the day. Right? And then how much are we over or short? Five dollars. So since we're over or short five dollars, we're going to put that in the cash over in short account. But something that you need to be mindful of, right now we're over by $5. If we were under $5, it wouldn't be a credit to cash and over in short, it would be a debit to cash over in short. Here's that example. We show that we only made for the day 625, but how much cash do we have in the register? 621 and so that means that we're short four dollars right so we're debiting cash for 621 that we show in the register we're also debiting cash over in short for the four dollars that um, we are missing in sales for 625 dollars so sometimes cash receipts may come by mail obviously you know customers mail in their payment so it says preferably, that's very important, preferably two people are assigned the task of opening mail. 
the cashier deposits the money in a bank and then the record keeper or the bookkeeper or whoever records the amounts received in the accounting records. Now what about cash disbursements? You guys ever heard of um, corporations when they pay a bill it's like oh anything over this amount there has to be two signatures for the check. So this is what this refers to. It requires that all expenditures are paid by check and it limits the access to the checks except for those who have the authority to sign them. So this is typically um, a route and it's talking about the voucher system. This is the route it goes and it's, it's a long process. So let's just say the company is ordering product from a wholesaler so that they can sell it retail, right? What happens is the company requests it. They do this voucher, which is a purchase requisition, in order to request it from who? The vendor, right? The vendor they're purchasing it from. So it goes from being a purchase requisition to a purchase order. The purchase order is completed by the supplier. The supplier sends it to accounting. Um, into purchasing, purchasing sends it to accounting, and then once the product is shipped out from the vendor, at that point, they send an invoice, which of course goes where? The account. To accounting. Accounting says we're not going to put this invoice in the system until we do what? Just because somebody said they ship product to you, should you account for that invoice until you do what? Until yeah. you receive the product. So they wait for the receiving report to come from the um, receiving department. And once the receiving department says, hey, we received the items, go ahead and process that invoice. The accounting then puts the invoice in to be approved and paid. The person who writes the checks then sends out the check to who? The supplier. <clears throat> One thing that um, people don't ever people don't ever really think it happens this way, but it does. Um, one of my last jobs before I got into teaching was I was the accounting manager at this telecommunications company, and um, we had maybe three accounts receivable clerks and two uh, payable clerks. Now the payable clerks actually wouldn't print any checks. They would put all the invoices in to be paid. So they would check it against whatever the purchase order was and make sure that that was what was actually received. And um, they would put it in the system to be paid and they would work on a cycle, so a 30-day cycle. Whatever was coming due in 30 days, then they would put it in to process for payment. I would be the one to actually print the checks and take them to the um, controller who would then, of course, sign them and um, approve them to be mailed out. But it is a very long, heart-wrenching process. Okay. It says, which of these following statements are true, which are false? A good system of internal control of cash provides adequate procedures for protecting both cash receipts and cash disbursements. Which of the following are true regarding the control of cash and disbursements? So number one, over-the-counter cash receipts from sales should be recorded on a cash register at the time of each sale. Is that true or false? True. True. Everybody says true. What about two? Custody over cash should be separate from the record keeping of cash. True. Um, True. Three, for control of cash receipts that arrive through the mail, two people should be assigned the task of and be present for opening that mail. True. True. Four, one key to controlling cash disbursements is to require that no expenditures be made by check. Instead, all expenditures should be made from petty cash. False. False. And five, a voucher system of control should be applied only to purchases of inventory and never to other expenditures. False. False. So let's see how accurate you were. 
Looks like you got them all right. True, 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 false, and false. Control of cash disbursements. So small payments required in most companies for items such as postage, carrier fees, repairs, and supplies, that typically can be paid from petty cash. Um, and the reason being is because it's so small that it's not worth cutting an entire check for. So you going to get five postage stamps is not worth you wasting a check to go and get five postage stamps, right? So you just pull that out of petty cash. So when operating petty cash, you first have to establish it. And in order to establish petty cash, you debit a petty cash fund or petty cash account and you credit cash. Now, as you spend at the end of the period, you always have to replenish it back to where it started. So here are all the expenses. This is the petty cash payments report. Um, notice the accounts and what they're paying for. And ultimately, they spent a total of what? $71.30. And how much did we establish in that account? $75. $75. So this is the journal entry that we record in order to replenish it back into the petty cash account. We um, debit all of the expenses that were paid and we credit cash for that amount because we're taking it out of the cash account and putting it back in petty cash to bring it back up to what amount? $75, right? All right, so let's try to do this. I want you to look at this and tell me what you've seen wrong. Identify four internal control items here from what you see up here in this little area. What's the first one you see? What's wrong with it? Just look at it a little closer. What do you see wrong automatically as soon as you look at it? Is everything in chronological order? No, the 14, no. Is, missing. 14, no. 14 is missing. Receipt 14 is missing. What's next? What kind of account is omitted? That's a problem. Why um, is 15 omitted? What's next? Approved by omitted for transaction 16, right? That's the problem. What's obvious? Look at the amount. How much did they tell you it started with? Right. And how much did it tell you it had in it? They missed 30. That's it. $30 are missing, right? Because they said how much was left? $19. $19. So if you add that 19 to here, do you get 150? No. It's not 19. It's it's not 30 dollars. But what's the difference? That's 139. So that means you're missing a whole how much? 11 dollars. So we're 11 dollars short. So that's it, right? All right, so those are all correct that you found. Now, notice something that it says here. It said, here, petty cash receipt number 15 does not indicate the account to be charged. If possible, management should determine the correct account. But if they don't determine the correct account, where do they put that? Under miscellaneous. So that's something that you need to be mindful of. All right, so what's the journal entry? to establish petty petty cash at this point. What do I debit and what do I credit? Petty cash, credit cash. 
Debit, petty cash, credit cash, how much? Um, 150. 150. And then what about the journal entry um, to, to replenish it? So, what do we debit? Delivery expense. How much was that? Twenty nine. What's the next one? Merchandise inventory. Eighteen. Um. What is it? Miscellaneous expense. Yes. How much is it? Thirty two plus forty one. 73. And am I missing anything? No. Mm. Can't be your cash over short. Cash over short. Which is $11. And we're going to credit what? Mm -mm. What's the account? You're replenishing petty cash. Credit cash. Credit cash for how much? It's not one thirty. It's what? Thirty two. How much is it when you add all these? One twenty. Twenty nine plus eighteen plus seventy three plus eleven. 131. So that's what we're replenishing. Yes. So it says, what is the petty cash account balance immediately before reimbursement? It doesn't change. And the reason it doesn't change is because we're not taking it up or taking it down. It's still going to be 150, right? That's what we started with. That's what we're trying to end with. So bank, basic bank services, this is nothing new to you. Um, I hope most of you have or have had bank accounts, checks, bank statements, EFT, we typically call it debit now, deposit tickets or deposit slips, right? So this is their idea of what a bank statement should look like. Um, when you're doing a bank reconciliation, the main thing that you're concerned about, obviously, are any fees that have been added because of something that happened with the account. You're looking at what the um, current balance says it is, right? You're looking at total checks and total deposits and also reconciling that along with your books to see what checks have not been cleared and what deposits have not been made. So this is typically how bank reconciliation works. You're looking at the bank balance and you're also looking at the book balance. What typically happens with the bank is that they'll give you a ending balance for the month, right? And any deposits you don't see on there, we call those deposits in transit. We need to add it back to that balance. Any checks that you see have not cleared, but you know you wrote them, then we have to subtract those from the bank balance and add or subtract any errors that may have occurred depending on who made the errors versus the actual accounting books. We add in any collections that the bank made on our behalf, any interest that they paid us, subtract out any items that maybe have been uncollectible, and add or subtract any errors. This process is relatively simple, so I want to try this exercise with you. Now, there are certain journal entries that you have to make, but they're, they're only on the book side. So if the bank collects cash for you, collects a receivable for you, you have to make a journal entry to show the cash that you received from that collection, what they charged you as a fee for collecting it for you, and removing it out of that receivable account. Um, if they pay you interest, you just have to show the cash received for the interest and also increase interest revenue. If they charge you a check printing charge or any kind of charge, you have to debit that to whatever the expense account is and credit your cash. And what happens if a customer pays you with a bad check and the check bounces? Right. 
So we charge that fee, that NSF fee to them. Um, so whenever they do pay, they're going to pay whatever their normal accounts receivable was, plus yeah, plus the NSF. So let's look at this. Take a moment to write this down. Um, well, actually, can you copy it? Here we go. This is easier. So, letter A. December 1st, the cash balance according to the accounting records was what? 1610. What side does that go on? Book. So, book balance started off with 1610. And it says the bank statement cash balance for that date was 1900. It says Gucci's December 31st daily cash receipts of $800 were pay placed in the bank's night depository on December 31st, but do not appear on the statement. So we know that we did it, right? We know that we deposited it. So the book balance is just not affected. It already is included. However, that signifies a deposit in transit, right? So we're going to add or deduct deposits in transit. Add. add. So we're going to add 800. Cross that out, cross that out. See, check number 6273 for 400 and check number 6282 for 100, both written and entered in the accounting records, are not among canceled checks. So if they're not among canceled checks, that means that they're what? What's that word, that O word? Outstanding. Outstanding checks, which means we take them from what balance? The bank. Bank balance, and do we add or subtract them? Subtract. Subtract them. So, sixty-two seventy-three for how much? One hundred. Sixty-two eighty-two. And then it says two checks. Number 6231 for 2000 and 6242 for 200 were outstanding on the most recent November 30th reconciliation. But check 6231 is listed in canceled checks, but 6242 is not. Deduct 6242. Mm. No, no error. It's just saying 6231 was canceled. 6242 is still um, outstanding, right? 200. we have that right so far have that right so far and that's right so far here are the rest of the transactions d when december checks are compared with entries in the accounting records it is found that check number 6267 has been correctly drawn for 340 to pay office supplies but there was an error in recording it and they actually recorded it as 430. what's the difference between 340 and 430 Calculate it again because everybody in here is supposed to have calculators out. The difference between 430 and 340 is what? 340. What's the difference? It's $90. $90. So they're saying that who, who recorded it correctly? The bank, the bank recorded it correctly. We didn't record it correctly in the books, right? So where does that $90 go? Add or deduct? Deduct. deduct. You're saying deduct 90? Think about what? I know you're going... Um, so, 90 
Deduct 90 or add it? Add it. Why add it? Did we give them too much? They recorded it at the right. They recorded it. We did record it. On our mind, we gave them too much money. We paid too much money. We paid too much money. No, that's not what they're saying. What they're saying is we might have wrote the check to them. We might have sent the check to them for the 340, but we recorded it in, in, in our books at 430. So that means you got to add 90 back. Hey, Mr. Kelly. What day, what day is the day? Uh, so you got to add it back to the books because you already sent it out, right? At 430, well, you sent it out at 340, but you put it in your books that you sent it out at 430, which means you need to take that back and put it back in your books. What about letter E, credit memorandum? They collected $500 on their behalf, right? But they charged them how much for collecting that? $30. $30, which means that your accounting book should only reflect how much? How much is it? Four seventy, right? Yeah? Yeah. And then F, they sent out a debit memorandum. One of them was $150, which was an NSF check for $140. They charged them $10 for the NSF. And then it says the bank assessed, yeah, $10 fee for processing. And then the second debit memorandum was for check printing. So how do we record that? You deduct. What now? Say it again. Deduct what from book balance? The NSF, the one fifty, and the twenty dollars. Check printing. So ultimately, the goal is to get to what for both balances, both sides. They need to equal. In this case, it's 2000 right? Take a picture of that if you need it before I switch over to the next thing. Nobody needs it. Yeah. Help me out when you're done. Okay. So the journal entries that we have to make, the journal entries we have to make are completely with the book side because remember how they... Um, we had that check error, right? We have to show that we are adding that $90 back to our cash and that we are um, decreasing our office supplies by that $90. So that goes there. And then when they the bank collected that note for us for $500, we showed that they gave us cash ultimately of $470, right? They took a collection expense from us of $30 and the total notes receivable is going to be the $500 which is what it was originally and then lastly um, we got to put this back in that accounts receivable account because the person paid but they gave us a bad check so we got to put it back now they still owe us the 150 right um, and that's it it was 140 but they owe us 150 now because of the fee the $10 fee and then lastly, the check printing charge we put up under miscellaneous for $20. All right. So that's it for.